contemplate with an inward eye the chain of successive revelations. I testify before God that each one of these manifestations hath been sent down through the operation of the divine will and purpose, that each hath been the bearer of a specific message, that each hath been entrusted with a divinely revealed book and been commissioned to unravel the mysteries of a mighty tablet. The measure of the revelation with which every one of them hath been identified had been definitely foreordained, Baha'u'llah. Likewise, the divine religions of the holy manifestations of God are in reality one, though in name and nomenclature they may differ. Man must be a, a lover of the light, no matter from what day string it may appear. He must be a lover of the rose, no matter in what soil it may be growing. He must be a seeker of the truth, no matter what the source it come. Abdul Baha. Thank you. So today we're really happy to have Mr. Steve Sarowitz with us. And his topic today is, can you be Jewish and Baha'i at the same time? Steve Sarowitz is founder and chairman of Paylocity, director of Payscape, a UK payroll provider, and co-chairman of Wayfarer Studios. He's an international philanthropist with an interest in promoting unity by and promoting education and advocating for the elimination of racism, sexism, nationalism, and religious prejudice. Steve served as executive producer for the award-winning documentaries, Maya Angelou and I Still Rise, and The Gate, Dawn of the Baha'i Faith. Steve is married with two children and holds a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Illinois. And with that, I'll hand it off to Mr. Sarowitz. Thank you very much for having me. So the question is, can I be Jewish and can I be Baha'i or can I be Christian and Baha'i? Well, let me start off by talking a little bit about my personal journey. I was uh, born and raised Jewish. So my family has been Jewish for thousands of years. Uh, I was uh, named after my great grandfather, Shmuel Yitzchak Sufiovich, which would be qu roughly equivalent in English to Steve and Ira Sarowitz. Um, and he was killed in the Holocaust along with 18 other relatives. So we had a lot of things in our family uh, keeping us Jewish, a, a long history of being Jewish. And uh, really the idea that changing our religion after so many people were killed in the Holocaust would really be a betrayal of my, my Jewish ancestry, ancestry. So how did I end up becoming a Baha'i and how does that affect my Judaism? So. It really starts uh, when I was about 19 or 20, I was in college and I went to Hillel, the Jewish center on campus at University of Illinois. And someone presented this new faith that I'd never heard anything about called the Baha'i faith. And it said that the, the speaker there um, had said, said that Baha'is believe that all religions were one. He talked about this thing called progressive revelation and he talked about the oneness of humanity. And that was all very attractive to me. I thought, well, that sounds a lot better than I'm right as a Jew and the Christians are wrong or the Christians are right and I'm wrong or the Muslims are right and the Christians are wrong. It just seemed kind of confusing to me. Religion seemed confusing. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a very logical person. I actually went to U of I for engineering, almost failed out and I graduated in economics. Um, but I, I always had a logical mind. So logically, it didn't make sense that there's a, a Jewish God, a Christian God, a Muslim God, because every religion says there's one God. So I didn't understand, you know, why the religions were different or why was I different than my Christian friends? I knew I was different than my Christian friends, but I didn't know why. I just was. And I hadn't really studied it. I hadn't studied religion very much. I didn't know anything about the Christian Bible. Um, I didn't end up studying the Baha'i faith at that time. I thought it was interesting, but I didn't do anything with it. Five years later, I opened a Chinese restaurant and, and I had a driver uh, by the name of Kevin, who's a pastor. And, and Kevin asked me if I, I, I he asked me, he's, a, he was, he's an evangelical Christian. He said to me, do you want to study the, the Christian faith? And I said, no, I'm Jewish. And he asked me again. And I said, no, I'm Jewish. And he asked me a third time because uh, he was very persistent, very kind, but very persistent. And I said, why not? I'll study the Bible. So I started reading the Christian Bible. And after a few months, I really couldn't figure out why I didn't believe in Jesus anymore because I'd been told I didn't believe in Jesus. But what did that mean? Did I not believe that Jesus exists or did I not believe in what he, what he said? I had no idea before what he said. So as I started reading the words of Jesus, 
I started realizing that I actually like the words. In fact, I love the words of Jesus. He was very kind. He was very peaceful. I, I didn't understand why I shouldn't believe in him. And so I really think to this day that, that most Jews who, who have studied the Bible or actually studied the word of Jesus would agree with the words of Jesus. It's just that they haven't and they wouldn't because they're Jewish. And so we're, we're kind of put in this box and all of us are put in this box, whether we're born Christian or, or, or Jewish or Muslim, um, even sometimes born Baha'i. You, you have to look at the other religions and understand what they think, what they feel. And we should be free to investigate truth for ourselves. So that was a big part of my journey. Now, I started dating my wife right around the same time. Uh, we've been married now 26 years. And we started dating in, in 1991, so a long time ago, over 30 years ago. And she asked me right around this time, she said, if we were to raise our children, if we were to have children, she's Catholic, I was Jewish. Um, she said, how would you want to raise the children? And of course, with her being Catholic and me being Jewish, I said, Baha'i. And she said, no, a real religion. And I, and Jewish or Catholic. And I didn't know enough about the Baha'i faith at that time. Now, the reason I said Baha'i was because I thought then, and I still think now, being a Baha'i, that the Baha'i faith encompassed really both Christianity and Judaism. And actually knowing a lot more about the Baha'i faith now, I kind of think I should have stuck to my guns, but I, I didn't know much about Baha'i. I couldn't really defend the faith. I, you know, I, I didn't know that, it, you know, I didn't know how to explain to her that it was a real faith. And so we ended up deciding that if we ever had children, we'd raise them Jewish. Years went by and we got married and we had children. And we ended up raising them Jewish. And it wasn't until my mid 40s that I had a friend I was running with that um, he was a Baha'i. And after several years of running together, he said, would you like to come to a, what they call a Rui class, a Baha'i study group? So I went to the Baha'i study group. And after a few years of doing this, um, I was actually studying the history of, of the Baha'i faith and the life of Baha'u'llah. I realized that I believed in Baha'u'llah. I believe that Baha I believe Baha'u'llah's claim that he is the messenger for this age. So I went home to my wife and I was very excited. I said, I'm a Baha'i now. This was in 2013. And she said, no, you're not a Baha'i. You're the Jewish one. I'm the Catholic one. We're about to have a bar mitzvah in two and a half years for two kids. We had twins. We have twins. And she said, you have to wait till after the bar mitzvah. And so, I sat down to wait, and six months later, Paylosity, the company that I founded, went public. And I decided to start giving away money because we, we'd, come, we'd basically become very wealthy. And I called up a man named Bill Strickland. I said, Bill, um, last week, and this is probably very pertinent now with what's happening in the news, but last week there were 22 shootings in Chicago. And the week before, the weekend before there were 22 shootings in Chicago and I don't know what to do about it, but you built these beautiful centers. I saw you speak about five years ago and I'd love to build a center in Chicago. And Bill and I started talking about that center and about five or six conversations into it, uh, actually pictured behind me is Akko Israel. And uh, Bill says to me, five or six conversations in, I'm talking to these Jewish philanthropists about building a center in Akko, Israel. And I almost fell out of my seat because at the time I decided to become a Baha'i. I didn't, still didn't know that much about the Baha'i faith because I was not yet a Baha'i. But I prayed and still pray, as all Baha'is do, towards Akko every day. And I said, Bill, did you just say Akko? And he said, yes. Well, I, why Akko? He said, because the Jews and the Arabs get along better in Akko. I, he tried another town, Carmiel, and they didn't get along so well in Carmiel. And so Bill goes to Akko, and I went to Akko with Bill in 2014. September 12, 2014. I'm going to change my background, actually. I walked into this garden right here. And I walked into this garden. And this is the garden surrounding the shrine of Baha'u'llah. It's the holiest place for Baha'is in the world. And looking at it back, this was seven years ago, over seven years ago, seven and a half years ago now, um, I fell into a swoon. I didn't know this at the time. But I, I, I just found out recently that people who visited Baha'u'llah when he was alive used to fall into a swoon. One man actually fell into a swoon and never recovered. 
I fell into a swoon and I, I'm, I guess I'm still not fully recovered. But for the next, basically, as soon as I walked out of that garden, I was a changed person. I saw that we're living in a new age. I saw that this was the age of Baha'u'llah. I saw that he had, in, he had envisioned the new age, had given us all the teachings. And I cried because we're not putting them into place. Not yet. That a couple hours away from this beautiful garden was a war zone in Syria. And so many wars going on, so many people hating each other, not listening to the words of God, not listening to the idea that we're one human family. I started teaching the Baha'i faith nonstop. Uh, I couldn't help myself. I'd open my mouth and all I would talk about is the Baha'i faith. My wife actually thought I went crazy. She sent me to two psychologists to see if I was crazy. And they said, both of them said the same thing. They said, well, either you've had a, a religious transformation or you're crazy. And I said, well, I did have a spiritual transformation. And, and actually they, they didn't say I was crazy. They both thought it was very sane, that I was very, I knew exactly what I was saying. My wife was very disappointed. She really wanted them to, to pronounce me as being crazy, but um, I ended up becoming a Baha'i less than six months later. And um, the, um, I, I, that was February 10th, 2000, uh, 2015. I declared three days later, I emailed my friend Farshid and I said, I'm a Baha'i now. And he says, and I told him I wanted to retire and just teach the Baha'i faith because that's all I wanted to do. I said, I don't need to make any more money. And Farshid said, you could do that or you could make a movie. If you, if you just teach the faith, you could reach hundreds of people. But if you make a movie and you have the means to do it, you could reach millions of people. So here I was a Baha'i for three days, knew nothing about the movie business. And that became a three-year odyssey uh, to make the gate dawn of the Baha'i faith. And so I learned, I learned on the way. In retrospect, going back now seven years, seven and a half years, um, it's crazy that I would be almost chosen to make that movie because I had no business making it, not knowing anything about the movies and just being such a new Baha'i. But I'm really grateful to God that I could make that movie. So anyway, so now going back to the topic. So that kind of, that's how I got here. So I, I'm, I was raised Jewish. My whole family is Jewish. We've got a Holocaust story. And now I become a Baha'i. My dad um, asked me, he said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And I said, yes. He said, well, that's the end of our conversation. He also thought for many years and told me for many years that I had joined a cult and they were going to take all my money. And I kept telling him, dad, it's not a cult. And I keep trying to give them more money than they'll take because they don't want it. And uh, finally, after about six years, he called me and apologized and said, I'm sorry, you know, it's made you a better person. Um, and he's become much more friendly towards the faith. Um, the question is, can I be a Jew and can I be a Baha'i? Well, there's really only one faith of God. So if you look at the Baha'i faith, what the Baha'i faith is, is the latest chapter in a single faith of God. So Judaism is merely an early cha earlier chapter in the Baha'i faith. So is Christianity, so is Zoroastrianism, so is Islam, so is Buddhism and, and, and Hinduism, each one of them. So if you look at really the history of the world, every messenger of God comes, they come with this beautiful message of love and kindness and compassion and mercy and truth and justice. And they also come with social laws and teachings because humanity changes. So God is educating humanity throughout the course of history. And so as God's been educating humanity, um, he's been sending these messengers. And after every messenger, every messenger suffers because the religious leaders from the previous era don't want to lose their power. So they crucify or, or persecute the messenger. Um, and then the messenger's word gets out anyway, despite this persecution. And a golden age follows for the followers of the messenger. So for the Jews who followed Moses, they, when they were exiled out of Egypt, they got to the kingdom of Israel, which lasts for hundreds of years. So this is an incredible golden age for the Jews. And actually Socrates and Aristotle, they learn at the feet of Hebrew scholars. So it was a very, very powerful golden age for not just the Jews, but for the whole world. The next one is Zoroaster. And, and of course, he's persecuted. They jail him, the priests try three times to kill him, but he survives, the king adopts his faith, and that becomes the great Persian empire, the seeds for the great Persian empire, which lasts for over a thousand years, 
And that's really the centerpiece for a Zoroastrian golden age. The next golden age is Buddhist because Buddha comes and Buddha suffers. He talks about his suffering. And yet he's followed by this incredible Maurya empire. This is Buddhist golden age centering on the Maurya empire, which it's 2 million square miles at its peak. 500 years after Buddha comes Jesus and Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the Jews are expecting the Messiah. And then Jesus comes and of course he's rejected as all the messengers were. He's crucified after just three years of ministry. And yet the, the ministry doesn't die. It expands and expands and it becomes a great golden age for Christians. And it centers on the great Byzantine empire, which lasts for over a thousand years. And so this pattern just keeps going and going. The next one is uh, 600 years later, Muhammad, he comes to a terrible place, terrible time. They all came to a terrible place, a terrible time. And he starts teaching love and kindness and justice and mercy and unity. And he comes to this place where they're burying their daughters alive. Men are killing each other so fast in war that women have become expendable. And so the women who live probably do even worse than the, the, the poor the young baby girls who were killed. And Muhammad starts teaching these beautiful things like all the rest of the messengers of God. And he unites not just the Arabian Peninsula, but all the way up to Persia and all the way across Northern Africa and all the way to Spain. In fact, interestingly enough, at one point, over half the Jews in the world were living in Spain underneath the Muslims. So there's, um, we'll talk about that later, but that, at that point in time, Islam was the most tolerant religion in the world, just like Christianity during its golden age was tolerant. And Zoroastrianism was known for its tolerance in, in the peak of the Persian empire. So there's a great golden age that follows Muhammad that lasts 500 years. So essentially, just think of it, the faith of God after, after Moses, the faith of God after Jesus, the faith of God after Muhammad. And now what era are we in? So in the mid 1800s comes the Bab in 1844. Now that's, this is a time of great expectations from three religions, the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, all expecting a promised one. The Jews expecting the Messiah based on their book, the Zohar. The Jews were expecting a return to Israel and a technological revolution. Interestingly enough, the return to Israel comes right on time, 1844 with the Ottoman Edict of Toleration and the Jews start moving back. Just a handful of Jews, maybe 5,000 Jews in the Holy Land in 1844. By 1948, there's 600,000 Jews. Today, over 7 million Jews in this great modern state of Israel that's in my background and where Baha'u'llah is, is resting today. So the Jews get two out of three, but no Messiah. Around that same time, the Christians are waiting for the return of Christ all over the world, in Germany and France and Scandinavia and Switzerland and England, in Holland, in America, Hundreds of thousands of Christians are following ministers and all these separate movements have sprung up, the Adventist movements, expecting the imminent return of Jesus Christ based on Bible signs. Martin Luther predicts 1840, John Wesley and the Methodists 1836, Joseph Smith and the Mormons throughout the 1830s and early 1840s, and a woman named, oh, uh, what is her name? Harriet Livermore. She actually proclaims in 1843, from the seat of Congress, from the seat of the, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, that Jesus, that Christ is going to imminently return. But the biggest one of all in America is William Miller. William Miller predicts that Christ will return in 1844. He and his followers finally settle on a date, October 22nd, 1844. 100,000 people in America are waiting for Christ to return and the world to end, and it doesn't end. They wake up on October 23rd, 1844, and they're incredibly disappointed that the world hasn't ended. And the reason the world hasn't ended, well, actually the reason why Miller thought the world was going to end was because the Christian Bible at the time had a mistake in it. There was one word that was mistranslated in the King James Bible, and it was actually mistranslated in several verses. It says, Jesus says, when is this all going to happen? And it says at the end of the world. The actual verse says at the end of the age. That was what the original word said. It was mistranslated. In all the newer Bibles, it's now translated back correctly, end of the age. But it was too late for all the Adventists 
because the Adventists were expecting the end of the world. So in Germany and France and Scandinavia and Switzerland and 700 ministers in England, 300 ministers in North America, they all expected the end of the world and it didn't happen. What's also interesting in the Christian Bible is the number 1260. It's in there in 10 separate verses, seven times in the book of Revelation and three times in the book of Daniel. But not many Christians know what that means. What's interesting is the Christian, during that time of the Christian Adventist movement, right at the heart of it in 1844, Muslims knew what that meant, although they weren't looking at the Christian Bible. The, the year 1260 was a big year in Persia. Shia Muslims, they're waiting for the 12th Imam to return. He disappeared in 260, and they expected most of, most of Persia at that time expected him to return a thousand years later in the year 1260. And that just so happens to be 1844, the same year Miller expected Christ to return. And so the Bob comes on May 23rd, 1844. And starts this incredible new age. Most of the Persians, most of the Shia Muslims were expecting a thousand year old man to come out of hiding, but that didn't happen. The Bob came as a young man. And a group called the Shakis, tens of thousands of very, very advanced Muslims expected this. And they embraced him by the thousands. He got over 100,000 followers. Unfortunately, the mullahs of Persia, like the religious leaders of the past, couldn't accept him. So they killed him and 20,000 of his followers. And the last remaining leader in 1852 was Baha'u'llah, Persian nobleman. And Baha'u'llah, known for his early wisdom at the age of 13, known as the father of the poor, he was, he was the son of one of the wealthiest men in Persia, is now in 1852, the last remaining leader in the Babi cause. They take him with a hundred pound chains, put him in a place called the Black Pit, three stories underground. And it's there that he sees a vision of the maiden that he's the promised one of all faiths. And importantly, so he's, so he's the 10th avatar for the Hindus, the fifth Buddha for the, for the Buddhists, He's the Shah Baram for the Zoroastrians, and he's the return of Christ for the Christians and the Muslims. But for purposes of this talk, he is the Messiah for the Jews, that long awaited Messiah. And where is he buried? In Israel itself. And what does he do when he comes there? So Baha'u'llah was exiled four times. He revealed the equivalent of 60 Christian Bibles. And his fourth and final exile was in 1868 to what was then Palestine, what is now Israel. And the first thing he did was, was pray for the return of the Jews. And did they, have they ever returned? Was his prayer answered? You know, there's many people who say that the, the modern state of Israel can't exist because the Messiah hasn't come. And I always say, well, that's very illogical. It makes a lot more sense to say the Messiah has come. And so the Bible has come true. We have this glorious new age. 75% of the inventions in the history of the world have been invented since 1844. Women's rights, civil rights, the idea of one human race, the idea that the earth is but one country and mankind is citizens, all these ideas are flowing throughout humanity and we need to, them to flow more. Look at the world today. Baha'u'llah said we're one human race, get rid of racism, that women are equal to men and always have been in the eyes of God. We need that message to get out there. And perhaps his biggest message of all, that we have one religion, one faith. So can I be Jewish and Baha'i? Well, yes and no. It's only one faith. So yes, really, I am following the Jewish faith, and I'm following it to its natural end, to, to follow the Messiah. So as a Jew who followed the Messiah, I'm now a Baha'i. And in that, that way, I'm both. Do I reject the Torah? No. Do I reject Moses and his teachings? No, I accept them, absolutely. Do I reject Jesus? No, I accept him, absolutely. Do I reject Muhammad? No, I accept him, absolutely. And I accept the Quran, the Bible, the Zoroastrian teachings and the Buddhist teachings. And I acknowledge that their purpose, all of them was unity. All of them was love. And all those teachers, Jesus and Muhammad and Zoroaster and, and Moses, they told us to love our neighbor. None of them, not one of them made any exceptions. 
And so I ask people today, look at the world today in America with all these mass shootings. So many places where there's war in Russia and Ukraine right now. Are we following God's word? Are we doing what he wants? Or can we work harder on loving each other? And so I don't want to fight with anyone about whether I'm Jewish or Baha'i. I'm a lover of God. And if you want to call yourself a Jew and love God, I will love you for doing that and honor you for doing that. And if you want to love God and call yourself a Baha'i or a Christian or a Muslim, that's great. And if you want to pray with me, whether it be in a mosque or a temple or a church or in a beautiful Baha'i temple, I'm okay with that. It's the same God. How could we think there's more than one God when every religion, every holy book says there's only one God and that God has told us to love each other. And that's what I really am here to say is that we need to do that so much more today. And so am I a Jew? Yes. Am I a proud Jew? Yes. I'm a Jew as long as I can also be a Christian. I'm a Christian as long as I can also be a Muslim and I'm a Muslim as long as I can also be a Baha'i. Why are most people Christian or Jewish or Muslim? 90% of the people I talk to, 95% of the people I talk to are that because their parents were that. And then there's those who are nothing because they don't wanna be their parents' religion. But that's not what we should be doing. What we should be doing is searching for truth without question and without prejudice. And we should forget everything we know and search for truth. And when we find the truth, according to Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, we will find that the truth is one. There's only one God, and there's only one faith, and there's only one humanity. And the sooner we learn that, the better. So with that, I'd love to open it up to questions. Thank you so much for sharing your, your journey and your story. Um, yeah, we have time for questions, and you can put it in the chat. Our first question is, today, Jewish people all over the world are celebrating Shavuot, the day 3,334 years ago that Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Torah and the Ten Commandments to present to the Israelites who had been waiting for him in the desert below for 40 days and 40 nights. During that time, some lost patience and faith that he would return. They took leadership into their own hands and convinced others to revert back to the only way they knew to survive. They built an idol representing what they had learned under the Pharaoh in Egypt. How miraculous it was that the first and second commandments seemed to anticipate and correct their behavior before it even happened. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage, and you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image, nor any manner of likeness of anything that is in heaven above. So the question is, what is the relationship of Shavuot to the Baha'i Revelation? Well, it's an earlier version. So this covenant of God has been renewed in every age. So God had come down to his people. And so God had come down to his people and said, here is the covenant for this age. And he takes care of them. He gives them this incredible present. And, and it leads to this. is So essentially, God is planting a fruit, a tree, a seed. And that tree flowers and grows. And what happened in that day eventually became the kingdom of Israel. So the great kingdom of Israel, the great kingdoms of David and Solomon, this incredible place for learning, for peace, for prosperity, for his followers. So essentially, this is, this is celebrating the beginning. And today, if we want to look at an equivalent, we might look at uh, Rizwan, uh, which is a Baha'i holiday where, where Baha'u'llah announces that he is the promised one of all faiths in the Garden of Rizwan in Baghdad. And, and, and so this happens um, in, in 1863. So this, this is, and then we are starting to see the fruits of that, still just starting to see that today. So we plant, God's planting the tree in every age. He does this with Jesus. He does this with Moses. He does this with Muhammad. I think sometimes we, we become so attached to the messenger and to the name of the messenger of the faith that we forget that there's only one God. And so we argue about this label or that label. And I don't want to, to, you know, to hate someone because they have a different label than me. That seems strange. You know, again, we, we're, we, we, we put the labels on each other, but we forget that there's only one God. Thank you. 
Um, how do you talk with Jewish friends about the faith and what are some successful points of topics that resonated with them? Um, I think Jewish depends on what type of Jew because there's different types of Jews. Um, Reform Jews um, resonate very much with social justice. And so talking about the equality of women, talking about uh, anti-racism, I think this is very good for Reformed Jews, the oneness of humanity. Um, for Orthodox Jews, um, talking about the faith and even some of the laws and the fact that our laws are very similar. Now, when I say very similar, um, similar in terms of conduct, but maybe not in terms of the penalty for that conduct. So, so we, you know, in the modern age, you're not going to chop off the hand of a thief. But we do have very, you know, Baha'is have very clear instructions on how to live a holy life. And uh, I think when, you know, I think actually Jews are sometimes surprised to find out that Baha'is have a very high standard and very similar standards. And so understanding, you know, some of the teachings, some of the spiritual teachings really um, is resonates with Orthodox Jews. And then for all Jews, this common tie in Israel, the idea that um, the Messiah has come and that Israel is a reflection of that. And that it's, there's a huge tie between the Baha'i faith, which is headquartered in Israel and Jews. And, and Jews, most Jews, not all Jews, but most Jews are, are very much, uh, they have a great love for Israel. So understanding that the Baha'i faith is based in Israel helps. And then of course, for me and for other Jews like me uh, who are interested in this, the idea of progressive revelation, that Judaism is a chapter, but not the only chapter. Thank you. Um, Baha'u'llah said this in the Tablet of Ahmad, be thou assured in thyself that verily he who turns away from this beauty hath also turned away from the messengers of the past and showeth pride towards God from all eternity to all eternity. If that quote is true by Baha'u'llah, wouldn't that mean that everyone who denies Baha'u'llah is denying the previous messengers, which in return means that they are denying the God you believe in? Wouldn't that also mean that you can't be a previous faith and a Baha'i at the same time? Yes and no. Um, so turning away from Baha'u'llah is not just, and there's a, Abdul Baha addresses this actually. He says, um, and this is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. He says, it's not an unforgivable sin to deny Baha'u'llah. It is an unforgivable sin to deny what Baha'u'llah and what God stands for. So if you hate love itself and you hate kindness itself and you hate mercy and, and the actual spiritual virtues, that he says is unforgivable. But if you deny Baha'u'llah out of ignorance, that can be rectified because you can eventually recognize Baha'u'llah. So many Baha'is like me were once Jews or Christians, and we can eventually recognize Baha'u'llah. So it's a temporary thing. <clears throat> Is it ideal for everyone to recognize Baha'u'llah? Absolutely. But are we going to condemn the followers of other faiths? No, because Baha'u'llah tells us that we're to, we're to consort with uh, with, with love and friendliness with all the followers of all religions and to understand that they're just following an earlier version. And so to me, it's very clear in, in, as I read the Baha'i teachings and it's, it's actually very clear in the Baha'i teachings that someone who's a Jew who's a good Jew is also a good Baha'i and someone who's a Christian is also a good Baha'i in terms of their conduct, in terms of their heart. And they may not know that Baha'u'llah is the messenger for this age, but if they're doing his will, if they're loving their neighbor, if they're being kind and loving and considerate and, and they're helping the stranger, isn't that following the Baha'i faith? So turning away from Baha'u'llah to me is not just denying that he is who he says he is, but it's actually not doing what he tells us to do, which is to love each other. And I respect those people who are Christian and Jewish and Muslim who are following their faith and being loving and kind to everyone they meet. Thank you. If one is both a Jew and a Baha'i, how would this person reconcile their seemingly inconsistent teachings? So the teachings aren't inconsistent. In fact, um, I have had multiple rabbis. I had one rabbi, I actually gave a, a little talk uh, in, to a Chabad uh, rabbi and his, and his students. Interestingly enough, somebody um, kind of attacked me for talking about another faith. 
And the rabbi defended me and said, I said nothing against Judaism. And then later we had a walk, we had a beautiful walk and talk. And the um, beautiful walk and talk, um, he said to me, he says, you know, I can't understand this. You say you're Baha'i, but everything you said is Jewish. And so Baha'u'llah actually says this. He says the essential spiritual teachings are one because this is one faith. And it's only the social laws and teachings that are different. So I went through all the similarities and differences. There are no conflicts between Judaism and the Baha'i faith, none whatsoever. What there are are previous social teachings which are no longer in effect. So for example, um, Jews don't, uh, when I'm in Israel, uh, Jews uh, don't use elevators on the Sabbath day. Well, they, what they do is they have to stop at every floor. Now as a Baha'i, I have no prohibition on using elevators or, or driving a car or doing anything on the Sabbath. And we don't have a weekly Sabbath like that where we can't work. So that's a difference between the Baha'i faith and the Jews and the Jewish faith. Another difference is Baha'is don't keep kosher. Again, this is a difference, but it's not a conflict. And what these are are previous laws that no longer apply in the modern age. Now, is pork still unhealthy to eat? Yes, I actually don't eat pork or I very, eat it very rarely because it's not very healthy. So, and that, you know, so it's not a conflict with, to me, if a Jew desire, desires not to eat pork or not to eat shrimp, which I also don't eat shrimp because I also don't consider it healthy. It's not a conflict, it's just they're following a law. When we have the conflicts, the quote unquote conflicts, it's almost always because we're misinterpreting our own teachings. So a great example of this is actually, and it's actually between the Muslims and the Christians, and it has to do with the crucifixion of, of Jesus. The Christian Bible clearly says that Jesus was crucified and died on the cross, whereas the <clears throat> Quran says that they slew him not. And so many Muslims believe that Jesus wasn't crucified, um, that he actually, um, there was either another person on the cross, an imposter on the cross. Baha'u'llah clarifies this and he says, the Christian Bible is right and the Quran is right. And the Quran is talking about uh, the Holy Spirit, the Christ Spirit. The Christ Spirit didn't die. And so <clears throat> there's actually not a conflict. It's an apparent conflict. So these apparent conflicts are usually resolved when we forget what we know sometimes, because what we know may be wrong. So for example, I had an apparent conflict with Christianity because I didn't believe in Jesus. And so that apparent conflict was resolved when I read the Bible and I read the words of Jesus for myself and realized I did believe in Jesus. I did believe in what he was saying, what he was teaching. And so we have these conflicts based on misunderstandings. The, the, when you really start understanding the truth of a religion, the, the true spiritual love behind every religion, the unity behind every religion, these conflicts disappear. Thank you. Could you, I guess, sort of related to that, could you speak to some general differences in Jewish people's behavior and mode of thinking that take place once they discover and embrace the Baha'i faith? So how did many Jews behave before and after attaining this new faith? Well, if I was a perfect Jew before I became a Baha'i, I would have had no difference whatsoever, uh, except I would have maybe had a few different customs and, and, and holidays. But I wasn't a perfect Jew. Um, I, I can speak for myself, not Jews in general, but I can speak for myself a couple things that changed. The Baha'i faith has a huge emphasis on not backbiting. And I can say when I was Jewish, um, backbiting is talking badly about people behind their back. I was not perfect in this regard. Um, still not perfect because nobody is, but I've really made an effort to be kinder to people and, 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 what I, and always look at the best part of people uh, because the Baha'i faith emphasizes this. Another uh, thing that changed in me is partisan politics. Before I became a Baha'i, um, I would engage in partisan politics. And now I always try to talk well of all political figures. Even, you know, the worst thing I might say is I, I might disagree with them or think that they don't do this particularly well, but I'm really careful not to attack them personally. And I know in this age of hyper-partisan politics, um, people attack a candidate or, uh, um, political leaders, and, and they think it's okay. And to me, that goes against every religion to attack someone. If I call this particular president or religious leader or, or, or political leader a name, if I call them an ugly name, 
even if they aren't a perfect person, calling them a name goes against the Christian religion, goes against the Jewish faith, goes against Islam, because every religion says love your neighbor. And it is not loving and kind to your neighbor to call them names, even if the neighbor is doing something bad. So what the Baha'i faith really taught me is to love in all situations. It made me, I think, a little bit more loving. And then there's even a higher level of honesty. Um, so it, I was, I think, a pretty honest person before, but the Baha'i faith doesn't have, it has an absolute standard for honesty. And so as a Baha'i, I've really learned to be even more honest than I was before. And there are certain gray areas in business where you, uh, an example of this is to call up a competitor and fake like you want to use their product. And I just won't do that as a Baha'i, whereas I would have done that before. And that was a very common thing people would do in my industry. Thank you. Can you talk about the idea of Israel being a future Baha'i Commonwealth and the nerve center of a promised global civilization? Well, Israel won't be the future of Baha'i Commonwealth. The whole world will be the future of Baha'i Commonwealth. So in every era, the messenger has given their message and then it's gradually been adopted by many followers. And if you think about it, it's, it's kind of successive waves of unity and growing larger in every age as humanity's capacity, as our spiritual capacity increases. And again, if we, if we forget our attachment to the names, whether it be Moses or Jesus or the particular religions that they represent, and just think of the faith of God growing in every age, this is the first age, according to Baha'u'llah, that the, the golden age will be global for all humanity. So it's not that we're all going to be Baha'is and, and, and Baha'is are going to steamroll other religions. Humanity is going to benefit from the word of God in this age. And the Baha'i Commonwealth will be, will be international. Israel will be the center of that Baha'i Commonwealth. Um, but it, it's not an Israeli thing. And it's not a Jewish thing. And in a sense, it's not even a Baha'i thing. It's a, it's a human thing. Because we'll all be beneficiaries of world peace. I mean, if anyone doesn't want world peace, then... Well, then we should keep things the way we are, the way we have them right now. But I personally want world peace. That's what I work for every day. I have a whole foundation that works for that. And if we're going to have world peace, we need world government. And we need a world government. You know, one of the things that I hear sometimes, I hear you know, it on Facebook just about every week is, oh my God, what about the one world government? And I always love to say it's really scary. Can you imagine one world government where we had competing countries that had nuclear weapons that don't like each other? And we had corruption and greed and all sorts of people competing for money and, and lying and cheating and doing all sorts of things and wars and, and superstition in the place of real, oh wait, that's the current world order. Sorry, I always get confused. That's the current world order. But for those people who are afraid of this new world order, they should be looking towards Christ. And the promise of the Bible in so many pages, page after page after page of the Bible, promising that Christ will return with a thousand years of peace. And that is the new world order. And new world order run by, by the words and the teachings of Christ himself. Who wouldn't want that? But yet preaching from the pulpits are many, are, are many preachers telling people to run from Christ himself. How sad. We need to embrace Christ, not run from Christ. And to look for Christ. So many Christians don't look for Christ. So many Jews don't look for the Messiah. I never looked for the Messiah for so many years. But if you really want the Messiah to come, look for the Messiah. When someone says they're Messiah, don't reject them. Look at them and say, who was this Baha'u'llah? Who was this glory of God? That's what his name means in English. If you're really looking for Christ, look at Baha'u'llah. And look at what he said and look at his life and decide for yourself, as I did, is he who he says he is? Because if, if, if Baha'u'llah is who he says he is, that's an incredible thing for the world. Thank you. What do I say to my Jewish relatives who believe in a tight-knit Jewish congregation rather than the whole of humanity as one family? And they say that following the daily rituals is more important than spiritual principles. Well, they could read the Torah and, and they could actually look at the Torah and they could talk to Chabad rabbis who would tell you spiritual principles are, are more important. It really depends on, on which Jewish relative. But yes, I think um, you could actually teach them as you could teach a Christian through the Bible. Um, 
when you when you start talking about the the seminal Jewish prayers, like the Via Hafta, which says to to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your soul, and to put these things on your doorposts and your foreheads. And what part of ritual is is and 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 love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, and all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so ask them the question, what does that mean? Go to their own teachings. Because love your neighbor as yourself does not mean just to be in this little tight-knit world where I'm just in a little box and I can only deal with people in my box. It means to love all your neighbors. And ask them where the exception is there. Where, where, did Moses make an exception not to love Christians? Did Moses make an exception not, not to love Muslims? I don't think so. He was talking to the whole world. And in the height, and you can also tell them about progressive revelation and, and the teachings for this age and ask them if they think they're important, especially if it's a female Jewish relative. Is, the, is it important that women are equal to men? Is it important that science and religion stay in harmony? Where are these teachings from and who said them? You can, you, you know, there's ways to get people out of their boxes, but part of it, you know, it depends on the person. Each person has a different way to get to the truth. The, the, the important part is to find their way, to help them on their journey. And sometimes um, you walk away because they have to stay in their little box for now. Thank you. Can you please um, let us know with the society building goal of the nine-year plan of the Baha'is, how can we relate to Jews and their beliefs? Well, tikkun olam is a really important belief. And I forgot that in the last answer. So I'll add that. Tikkun olam is to, re is, to, is to repair the world. That's a very, very important Jewish belief, especially among Reformed Jews. And tikkun olam is a belief among all Jews. And so the nine-year plan, and really the whole entire Baha'i faith, is all about Tikkun Olam. It centers on Tikkun Olam. And so you cannot believe in Tikkun Olam and not have a plan. The Baha'i faith is actually a plan to do Tikkun Olam, which is to repair the world. So you can't say, I'm going to repair the world without knowing how. And what if there was an actual plan to repair the world, which is what the Baha'i faith does every day? Uh, T-I-K-K-U-N. Uh, space O-L-A-M is how you spell it, I think. Thank you. Do you have any film or other artistic projects in the making? We are working on a script about the life of Tahereh, who pulls off her veil in 1848, and she announces a new age and a new faith for all humanity. Tahereh was really the trumpet that's promised in, in, in all the old, uh, in, in the, old scriptures, the trumpet announcing the day of God has come. And so she was an amazing woman. She, um, she does this just days before the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. So she's really a, a great harbinger of, of women's rights. And before she died, uh, Tahare was a brilliant poet and a, a, a brilliant theologian. And before she died, she puts on her wedding dress. She, she looks her attackers, her would-be killers in the eye they actually do kill her. Um, she says, you can kill me as soon as you like, but you cannot stop the emancipation of women. And so we're making a film about her. Um, I'm working with the great Justin Baldoni. Uh, I, I've joined together with him in Wayfair Studios, and we're working on several projects. A lot of them are not directly Baha'i, but they're about the oneness of humanity. So for example, we have a, a a film with uh, also another Baha'i, a uh, wonderful Baha'i by the name of Rain Wilson, who played in The Office. He's, uh, he acts in a film called uh, Empire Waste, which is about a plus-size girl who wants to be a fashion designer. Um, the other, um, we have another film about uh, Craig Hodges, who was a basketball player who was uh, kicked out of the NBA due to racism, uh, very similar to Colin Kaepernick. We have another film called Racist Trees. Um, all of our films, are trying to lift people up. We have a film where we're gonna be shooting most likely next year, which is based on the book, It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover, which is um, trying to address um, child abuse. I'm sorry, spousal abuse, not child abuse. Um, and so just different, different films, different TV shows. Another one is The Defender, which is uh, profiling in a TV show, the uh, great Chicago newspaper, The Chicago Defender, which 
was uh, which was started by a Baha'i, Robert Abbott. And then we are, we're doing other things with Spring Green Films, which uh, we have uh, a project called The Universe Within, which is really taking the Baha'i writings and putting them to music and art. Exciting, thank you for sharing. Um, I, I guess I have a question. What would you say to certain people that say that you know Jews are the uh, chosen people and it would kind of fly in the face of their spiritual heritage to choose a different faith? Jews were chosen to spread the faith of Moses 3,500 years ago, and they did. And then the Zoroastrians were chosen to spread the faith of Zoroaster, which they did. The Buddhists were chosen to spread the faith of Buddha, which they did. The Christians were chosen to spread the faith of Christ, Jesus, which they did. And the Muslims were chosen to spread the faith of Muhammad, which they did. And now the Baha'is have been chosen to spread the faith of Baha'u'llah, which we're doing. We're all the chosen people. The Jews were chosen to spread the faith of God at a certain time in a certain place. And I would think, you know, the Jews were also told that they would, would come back to Israel, which they've done. And the Jews are protecting the faith of God in this day and age from attackers. So the Jewish army is an incredible army. The, the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, is doing an incredible job of protecting Israel in a very, very dangerous area. So the Jews are chosen to do another task right now, which is to defend the faith of God. But yes, you know, chosen, but chosen as in chosen to be better than other people or different than other people or set apart from other people? No, because we're one human family. Nobody is chosen that way. We're chosen to help God. And we're only the chosen when we promote God. And we promote faith for all people and the oneness of humanity. When we promote ourselves over other people, that's not good, whether we be Baha'is or Jews or, or Christians. Thank you. And have you seen or heard of many Jews embracing the faith? Yes, um, especially, um, yes, I see one right now waving at me. Hi, Dara. Um, yes, um, there are Jews who embrace the faith, uh, you know, just like, you know, Baha'i faith is relatively small in America. Most people have not embraced the faith yet, but in the future, other, many more people will. In the future, uh, America will be a Baha'i country. Every country will be a Baha'i country. And that's the, the Baha'i world commonwealth. The majority of the world will be Baha'i. So we know in, in the long run, Jews and Christians and Muslims will all embrace, embrace the Baha'i faith. Um, and that's just letting go of prejudice. When we let go of prejudice, we realize the truth of all the messengers. So when we embrace the Baha'i faith, we don't reject Judaism. We don't, I don't convert. I didn't convert to Baha'i. I, I declared. I declared my faith in Baha'u'llah. And so when Jews and Christians and Muslims and, and, and Hindus and Buddhists let go of the, the past and their own prejudices and embrace the messenger of today, which is Baha'u'llah and his message of peace and love for all humanity, we will have an incredible world. And so I always say to people, if you have something better than this, you know, I'm all, I'm open-minded. I, I remain open-minded. If you have something better than the Baha'i faith and the teachings of Baha'u'llah, bring it to me right away. I want to know. But this is the best thing I've ever found. And so I always encourage people, study it for yourself. Um, I have a couple of really good friends. I have one friend, uh, a black friend who's a Baha'i, amazing Baha'i, uh, by the name of Michael O'Neill. And he, um, in 1975, um, he joined uh, a black fraternity in Savannah, Georgia. He was from Philadelphia, he was 18 years old, and uh, came across this guy named George, who was a white guy joining this black fraternity and couldn't figure this out. George said he was, he'd come back from Vietnam and George said, oh, I'm a Baha'i. I believe in the oneness of humankind. And, and I believe that we're one human family, regardless of the color of our skin. And, and Michael, uh, being an 18 year old kid from Philadelphia wasn't having much of it, but eventually he and George became friends and he read the, the Baha'i writings to prove them wrong, to help his friend George uh, get out of this cult or whatever he was in. Of course, uh, Michael's been a Baha'i now since 1975. <laughs> I, I have other friends who've, who've read the Baha'i writings too. So I encourage everybody who's not a Baha'i, delve into the Baha'i writings, read them and try to prove them wrong with all your heart. And I'll see you at the next Baha'i meeting.
<laughs> it's hard. It's hard to prove them wrong. It's it's hard to argue with what Baha'u'llah taught. We're one human family. Women are equal to men. Science and religion must be in harmony. His teachings were radical and amazing in the 1800s, and they're radical and amazing now. And I encourage everyone to embrace them. I'm unequivocal in this. Now, if you don't want to embrace them, if you want to be Jewish or Christian or Muslim, that's fine. Um, as my friend Trevor, who's on this call, knows, I love Christians. I treat Christians with kindness and love, and I don't hate him for being a Christian or think he's worse than me. However, I do love Baha'u'llah, and I proclaim all the time that I love his teachings, and I think they're for everybody. Thank you. Um, I think we will end there. So thank you so much, Mr. Sarowitz. This was a very unique topic, and we appreciate your um, insight and experience. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. And our speaker next week will be Dr. James Keane. And his topic will be the first and last letters of the living, Mullah Hussein and Godus. So again, these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time. And I'll put a link to our contact form if you're not on our mailing list already. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Bye.